Thank you very much for the uh, warm introduction and uh, reception. Uh, there's a few more chairs. Uh, people are waving their hands and they're not at me. Uh, but there's actually several, several chairs way over here. Um, so, uh, well, this is a wonderful uh, experience for me. I've spent uh, a number of years in public service, uh, both in Michigan and uh, in Washington, and uh, pleased to be a resident of uh, Maryland in the last uh, 11 years. Um, and as a, as a part of the public policy, uh, uh, I wouldn't say establishment, but uh, with that focus for so many years of my life, to now be able to be a part of an infrastructure uh, program that has profound public policy implications is a, is a real thrill for me personally. Um, the Congress, as you all know, has not been successful in uh, developing an energy policy, and certainly a renewable energy policy. I'll tell one quick story that I worked in the Senate uh, back in the 70s, and when we had the Arab oil boycott in 73, 74, I was standing off the floor of the United States Senate, and there were four senators and a couple of staff people along with me talking about the long gas lines. And uh, one of the senators said, well, now America will be able to get an energy policy. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you laugh? Here we are today without an energy policy. But the project that we're working on has the ability to do something unusual in this country, and that is to take a proactive position to do something that will enable other things to happen. If you think back to the interstate highway, certainly there's some pros and minuses about urban sprawl, et cetera, because of the interstate, but initially, it enabled the opening up of our economy as a nation. And we have that same opportunity here with this Atlantic Wind Connection project. I want to pause and take a moment to give credit to another person from Maryland, uh, the spouse of uh, Jocelyn Pena Melnick, assemblywoman from uh, College Park. Her husband, Mark Ian, demonstrated uh, what uh, we all need to be reminded of. He studied, uh, off he studied ocean power, wrote a book, several page book, thick book, kind of the Bible of uh, ocean power. And in the process of writing that book, came up with the realization that if we're going to have a serious offshore industry, there had to be a backbone cable that would enabled the wind farms to connect. And Mike, you talked about how it, wind, you know, is up and down, of course. And that's always been a negative. The utilities have used that as a negative. Well, we don't want wind power because it's up and down. But when you take a line such as we're proposing that goes from New Jersey, northern New Jersey, to northern Virginia, 350 miles, and you conduct and you connect several wind farms along the way, what happens is because of the point you were making and a point that Willard uh, Kempton, a university professor from Delaware, in a study that he did showed that this, this, this radical variation gets smoothed out. It's not perfect, but it's smoothed out so that it's pretty consistent because the wind is blowing at some point, some time along the, along the coast. So Markian, just a lawyer, uh, did some research, had the idea that I'm going to do something about it. And other people had thought about a backbone. Many people had thought about a backbone. Wouldn't it be great to have a backbone? That's really what's needed, et cetera, et cetera. And he took the step and said, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm sure there's people in this audience who have that same ability, whether you're in the uh, Maryland Assembly or if you're the governor of the state. And by the way, I spent an hour and some minutes with the governor four days after the election. In fact, it must have been three days. Friday morning, uh, sitting down in the residence, uh, talking about this project. And I was thrilled at how attentive and how interested and how committed he is to, to offshore wind. 
you've got some great allies here with Coomer and Barat and Sally. It, it's really a terrific situation here in this state. But Markian took the step, and what he, as an inventor, if you will, uh, realized what a lot of inventors don't. I, I had the idea, but I don't necessarily <laughs> have the wherewithal to actually develop it. And uh, had the good sense, I, this is a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> had the good sense to call transit. Like, we have developed projects around the country. And, uh, and, and I was actually very skeptical. Uh, I've, I've developed uh, uh, transmission projects. We've bought uh, uh, transmission systems from utilities. And uh, they just never realized that right off the shore, and, and I'm a sailor, by the way, and I had a, a boat on boats at the moment, but I, I had a boat here in, in Annapolis. And it just never occurred to me that there was such potential. But in that bite that you're talking about, 64,000 megawatts of electricity as possible with offshore wind. Now, our backbone system will enable 6,000 megawatts to be built over the next 10 years, and we build in segments. Because we're using DC technology, we're going to be able to go 17, 18, 20 miles offshore. The photograph you showed where you see a little bit from uh, offshore or onshore, uh, there will be nothing that will be possible to see. The other advantage of going so far out is that the wind is stronger and bird migration, the state of New Jersey spent about $12 million um, uh, studying the environmental impacts of offshore wind. And they found that if you go out 15 miles or more, that the, the uh, interference with birds and mammal migration is basically non-existent. It's, they have a graph. This is the shore. The migration is closer to shore, and the further out you go, of course, it's less and less. And so there's enormous advantages to that. And we just found out yesterday, from got some results back from a study, that even if this transmission line at sea were built, there would be an enormous reduction in CO2 carbon, whether there was a wind farm built or not, because we are live in a very transmission congested corridor between Washington, D.C. and New York. It's the most, along with the area in Los Angeles, most congested transmission corridor in the, uh, in, in the United States. But this line will enable uh, cleaner energy to flow and will create a reduction. But more exciting, it will enable 6,000 megawatts of offshore wind. And what's significant about 6,000 megawatts is that it's a long way from 64, but it's a start. And this system is expandable to 10,000, to 15,000, 20,000. It's, it's, it's unlimited what you can do with DC uh, technician or technology. And uh, um, so we are, uh, there's about 55 things I want to be sure I say here in my next four minutes, and I'm uh, <laughs> trying to jam it, jam it all in. But uh, uh, this 6,000 megawatts is enough that if we can get the commitment to build the cable, the backbone, then the companies that are already engaged in developing turbines in Europe, in Japan, etc will be attracted to come to the United States and to develop plants. If we have to rely upon each wind farm building its own individual tie line, then we are simply not going to have the realization of the goals that we all have. It, it, it's too complicated, the grid is too weak to absorb on a one-by-one -one basis. And with the backbone, what we're able to do is to take the power further into shore. Our goal is to do that underground. Uh, we come in under the beaches and, and, and underground all the way to the larger substations. And uh, uh, it will enable it will enable these manufacturers that to, to say, yes, there's going to be a critical mass, be a critical mass in the United States for offshore wind. And we're going to come, we're going to build factories, we're going to create permanent jobs. And steel workers, which I'm so pleased that uh, Jim's here today, because uh, the, uh, 
the, the opportunities for economic development in the mid-Atlantic is, uh, is, is not all that positive. And uh, this is a opportunity to really um, have a significance. So in my last two minutes, uh, I did use one of my slides. So uh, the fellow from Google that was invited, Rick Needham, is very uh, sorry I wasn't able to make it. Google's been a great partner. We knew that if, I, I figured out, if I, wasn't, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. And, and so I knew that there would be a lot of skepticism about offshore wind. I certainly had it. But when I learned more about it, I became a believer. I knew that if we could attract an investor that would uh, create some bugs, that it would be a big help to our project. Frankly, I had no idea how much of a buzz Google can create. <laughs> but our announcement, our announcement uh, has generated over 1,800 news stories. And uh, I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> uh, so it really did uh, help. Good Energies, Marvani, were also a part of that. This, not anything. Here's the, uh, uh, all those black dots show where the population is in the United States. And the red shows where the wind potential is. You see how great it is off the East Coast. This is what it would look like if every individual wind farm built its own tie lines to uh, shore. And uh, we have a, a bit of a spaghetti effect in the sea, and I don't think any of us want that. Plus, with AC technology, they can't go as far out to sea as what we're able to do with DC technology. And this is what would be the configuration. Um, I don't think there's a pointer on this, but uh, the first leg will run from, uh, is there? Oh. Oh, not really. <laughs>